couple of other questions in along those lines. Obviously, these two gifts, apostle and prophet, were sort of paired together somehow in Ephesians 2.20, yeah, yeah, yeah. that there's something, uh, you know, a little bit of a partnership. I, I have this little phrase that I've said sometimes that, uh, you know, uh, a prophet without an apostle will build a fantasy. <laughs> An apostle without a prophet will build a factory, yeah, but the two yeah. together can build a family. Like there's something about the, the dynamic of that person who sees the blueprint and wants to build, or the person who has sort of an ear open to heaven and is, you know, kind of interacting. How do you see those two gifts working together? Because right now I'm concerned that, you know, we have apostles gathering over here, prophets gathering over here. Um, the interface between them seems limited. And we had all the prophets that, you know, spoke up during the election time, and that was odd. And, you know, there was challenges there. How do you see those two coming together and really being teamed together? Um, well, first of all, it's essential. Yeah. And it, it is a relational issue. And what happens is you find people that have discovered the uh, sobering call of God on their life, yeah. and they tend to want to protect that. And, uh, and there has to be a yielding for merging because mm -hmm. there is a complex. You described it very well, the prophet and the apostle, what each of them bring to the table, that together they actually bring a, a greater significance out of the other when they are yoked together correctly. Mm -hmm. When it's a relationship of honor, yeah. um, then they actually bring out, the apostle brings out uh, strength to the prophet that he's not going to get otherwise. And the prophet brings out a strength to the apostle that he's not going to get otherwise. You know, it's, sure. it's like both are, are absolutely essential and complementary. Yeah. And so we've got to, we've got to fight, fight to, protect the, to protect the relational component. Because that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, again, our father. It's family. Kingdom is family. Mm -hmm. And so the apostle and prophet has to be the best model of that. This is how we deal with conflict. This is how we deal with, uh, uh, you know, conflicting ideas or, or different perspective on our ministry responsibility, whatever it might be. This is, we do this thing together. Yeah. And, uh, and what's more important to me, let's say that you and I are the apostle, the apostle and prophet. Yeah. What's more important to me is our connection and that we do this together more than I accomplish all my wildest dreams. You know, I, I believe in vision, I believe in the dreams, but it's all meant to be done in the relational context. Moving at the speed of family. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, something I've seen here, you know, that in the decade I've been a part of this church and seen what you guys have built, it's just so amazing to see, even in moments of disagreement or conflict, how you guys have covenanted for outcomes exactly. that are relational. Yeah. You know, share a little bit about that with us, you know, obviously, not too much detail, but... <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's... It's, it, it's not complicated if you value people more than ideas. If you value people, then your, your default yeah. is going to be to protect, yes. to protect what's important. If you value relationship, your default, your, your energy, your focus, your prayer, your efforts are going to be focused on protecting that relational component. Yeah. And, uh, but if you're just an idea person, if you're just a person that, that, that somehow has to always there are people who are driven and there are people who are focused. Driven people get in trouble, mm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Focus is what we're supposed to be. That's and if we can be focused, then we make sure that we bring all the elements that Jesus intended into the vision and not leave them behind so I can accomplish a vision. Wow. So I don't know if that makes sense, but no, I mean, I... it does to me. And, well, you know, let's expand that. Let's expand that a little bit because... You know, you're part of a gathering of apostolic leaders that, you know, called Revival Alliance. And uh, many of them received sort of a, a fresh touch from the Lord at Toronto in, in the first few years of that outpouring. And, um, and yet you guys have kept a friendship. You've kept a relationship. You do a lot of co-workership. Um, Talk about that. You know, how does, how does that interface? Because you're not all identical. I mean, you all have different, you know, emphases and different points of view. And, but you also are carrying a certain set of common uh, values. How, how do you guys partner together? How does that work? Oh, it's just the greatest privilege ever. 
you know, to, to pour out, for me to pour out who I am to benefit somebody else and their ministry, their mm-hmm. network of churches, their leaders, their conferences, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, what a privilege to do what I can do to make sure that they're more successful. And they, in turn, have done the same for me. Wow. We, we, we consider it a privilege to not form one big organization out of the whole group, yeah. another denomination. Sure. I, I mean, I guess it could be fine, but we've chosen not to do that. We, instead, we've chosen, let's do what we can to help the other person succeed. Wow. Let's just use our gifts and, and the way, you know, when I, I'm with Randy many times a year, so I want to do what is most helpful for Randy. I don't have an agenda except to be a strength to him yeah. with John and Carol, with, uh, you yeah. know, uh, Heidi, Roland and Heidi and George and Winnie, you know, Che and Sue, yeah. the whole group. Um, that's it. I mean, I was just with Che a couple of weeks ago. I'm just there. I'm just there to help him. You know, I just want to be a strength to him. That's all. That's so and uh, and that that is the relational component. We yeah. do have, we, we take time every year uh, just to rest together. Yeah. Uh, we take a few days off just to go somewhere and we hang out by the pool and talk. We pray for each other. We, you know, <laughs> that's what we do. We go out to dinner. It's a pretty simple agenda. Wow. It's just to make sure that each other is healthy and strong. And, and that's what friends do. Yeah, and that's probably unique in the history of the church that there would be this amazing sort of uh, group of friends that share a sense of a common encounter with with God, that's true. That you guys have kind of touched the Lord in a similar way as one another, yeah. but at the same time, you've now been called to different kinds of emphasis, yeah. Yeah. and uh, it's really interesting to see because actually, you know, during this particular master class, yeah. you know, we have you sharing, and then we're going to have Duncan and Kate Smith, and we'll yeah. talk about this in a moment. Then John and Carol are not, and then. Yeah. Cheon will be sharing in the final week and really trying to get those different voices speaking, you know, and uh, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about is this issue of succession. Yeah. OK, and I know that um, I mean, I'm getting older. We're all getting older. And uh, there's an emerging generation of younger leaders that are rising up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just what happened within Catch the Fire recently with the transfer of authority from John and Carol Arnott. They're still obviously emeritus leaders of the whole movement, but you no, know, Duncan and Kate as younger leaders have now taken the mantle and run with that. Talk about succession. How do you see it working? How do you see it? Um, what is, and, and particularly in relationship to the concept of sustained revival, because that's one of the things you've, you've spoken about a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and how do you see those two working together? Um, well, absolutely necessary, obviously. Uh, who was it? Uh, someone in church history I read, I forgot who said it now, a su- uh, su- success without a successor is not success at all. And, uh, and so that's, that, that's a, a huge thing in my heart. Um, I was watching uh, a documentary with my wife. My wife and I don't watch a lot of documentaries together. <laughs> Actually, I was playing on my iPad while she was watching. Exactly. And uh, I, when I turn the TV on, it's not to learn anything. It's to be entertained, you know. <laughs> so uh, uh, so I, I'm playing with my iPad. She's sitting there watching this documentary. And this phrase came off out of this documentary. It was about monarch butterflies. Mm-hmm. And this phrase came out that said, uh, multi-generational migration. And I stopped. And I put my iPad down. I said, what was that? We, we actually rewound. We listened to this thing. We watched it. Multi-generational migration. The, the monarch butterflies, there's like 200 million of them in Mexico. And they migrate to Canada. But it takes four generations to get there. Yeah. And then it takes four generations to get back. And it hit me that none of us are going to be able to complete our assignment in our generation. But we have to so put into the DNA Mm. of each following generation the sense of purpose, commission, the direction, the intent of God on the earth has to be instilled in the hearts of a generation. And then relationally figure out how to apply that. But that thing just really burned in me when I heard it. And I, I knew that was the word I needed for this, this next season. That it's not just, you know, my children, which they're all in place. But it's my grandchildren. It's their yes. children. It's this multi-generational thing that God is wanting to do something so significant in the earth right. that not one generation can see it happen. Wow. And uh, so that means that we become, we, we honor and ride out the momentum of a previous generation. 
parents, right? I, I don't I don't honor my dad, for example, my grandparents. I don't honor them because uh, I don't honor them by building monuments to what they did. I honor them by going where they didn't have time to go, mm. carrying the momentum. They yeah. paid a price. I honor them by going where they didn't have time to go, and my children the same grandchildren. Wow. Yeah, I think uh, Dutch Sheets coined a phrase, the synergy of generations. Wow. And that's kind of like the, the last few verses of Hebrews 11. You know, talks about these guys didn't get it done, but they were looking forward. And uh, you know, I remember going to uh, Florence and, and touring this amazing building called the Duomo. And uh, that it was actually those who laid the foundations were not there to see the completed dome. It's like, how does that happen? You know, it's like we're such an instant society. It's hard for us to think of that. But I was actually thinking about Genesis, you know, chapter 1, verse 28, where God is giving the prime directive to Adam and Eve. And the third issue, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. You know, there's only one way of doing that when you start with one couple. <laughs> and that's through a thousand generations. 